Great relationships don't just happen, they're designed. But how do you get the love you really want when you haven't had the models and examples you needed? We've learned the hard way that talking about stuff can change everything, but it doesn't come naturally, and that's normal. Welcome to the Project Relationship Podcast. I'm Dr. Jolie Hamilton. And I'm Ken Hamilton. Join us as we explore the ups and downs of creating a custom-built love. We'll get personal and talk about what's worked for us, hear from Jolie about what the research can teach us about love, and answer listener questions. It's time to reimagine relationships from the ground up. Welcome to the Project Relationship Podcast. Today, we're going to talk about trust. Trust. Yeah, trust um, from a few different perspectives. I want to talk about it from the perspective of um, relationship, obviously, because that's our jam. Um, But also from both the building and the rebuilding. Which in my experience... Which means we kind of have to talk about what happens in the in-between. If if there's a rebuild, it means there's either been a breach of trust a there's lots of words we could use to describe what happens that would cause a rebuild to be necessary but you know we can't talk about trust without talking about Brene Brown it's, <laughs> no, it's not, not possible no. right um you can't even look at trust on the web without looking at Brene Brown right which is yeah. great um she has already sifted through the literature mm-hmm. and and created a really nice narrative around trust so building on that I want to say that because my research is in jealousy, trust definitely comes up. Sure, sure. And this is a place where I find myself challenged to to not accidentally leave the the jealousy question too early when I'm doing my research, not to leave jealousy. I'm trying to stay rooted and grounded in what are you feeling, what's going on around your jealousy, describe to me. And oftentimes people will veer off into stories about trust and how trust was violated okay um Mm -hmm. without even realizing it without meaning to and um those stories often displace uh, a lot of a lot of the ownership somebody can have around around what their levels of trust are okay so what I mean is just like leaving leaving the question of jealousy, for instance, too soon can lead us over into just a, a place where we sort of throw our hands up in the air. And we're like, I can't trust anyone or see, oh, I knew yeah, okay. I would be betrayed. Yeah. The B word. Betrayal. Betrayed. Right. OK. So um, Brene Brown talks about trust from the perspective of um, leadership as w- so in the workplace, as well yep. as in our interpersonal, close, um, intimate relationships. And I like the framework that she has laid out. The framework um, in braving, it, it's, it's following the acronym braving, mm-hmm. um, boundaries, reliability, accountability, vault. I like that one. Yeah. Integrity. Ah, I have trouble with that one. Vault. Well, I, I like how she put it together. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Maybe a little. Integrity, non-judgment, and generosity. So I'll just run down them again because they're they're not mine. They're 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 they definitely belong to Brene. Um, in and boundaries, reliability, accountability, vault, integrity, non judgment, and generosity. I like how they round out the concept yeah. of trust. Um, but there's a lot there. So I want to have a pretty focused conversation with you about trust. So let's dive into the part I struggle with. Uh, okay. Let's go right to right. V in let's this, in this v. framework of trust. Um, because I work with people very frequently. I'm working with people who are transitioning between monogamy and creative monogamy or monogamy and consensual non-monogamy. And oftentimes people are struggling with what's theirs to share. The vault is... Yeah. Um, in the braving model is about keeping confidence and not sharing information that isn't yours to share. Mm -hmm. And when we start adding other people to our intimate circles, now we have complexity. Yep. Um, This isn't a bad thing, but I think a lot of us may have wrestled with this last in like high school. (laughs) Right. About you've got like like multiple friends. You have like your your friend circle. And you don't necessarily know who's told who what, and you have to figure out what it's okay to share about. And we often don't do it well. 
And then there's gossip. Right. Which is a whole other thing. So but. the vault, the idea that I, I, I shouldn't be sharing your story. Your story isn't mine to share. When we start having multiple partners or even multiple close friendships, mm -hmm. now it becomes a little complex to think, okay, what part of a story that happens between the two of us belongs to me? And what part belongs to you? That is a complicated question. Yeah. And this is where I find um, there's a lot of room for growth. Mm -hmm. Con I, I find constant room for growth myself in figuring out what it means to build trust, to continually build trust with each of my partners, with each of my friends, while not reaching confidentialities um, without and without you know, like and confidentiality is such a that's a big word. Like that's all, that's my professional world. In my professional life, I have a a code of conduct conduct that um, sure. that outlines for me what com what is confidential and how and how I keep that and the very limited circumstances in which I can break that confidentiality. But in my day to day life, I'm bound by something even bigger. I think, which is my own ethical framework. Mm -hmm. My your understanding yeah. of how how people will be affected by what you say and share. Right. Because one of the reasons we have professional bounded relationships to share personal information is because those relationships are one way. They're, they're, they're unidirectional and, and they can be cordoned off from the rest of your life. So sharing doesn't come up because I don't know anybody else in your life. So there's no, yeah. there's no one for me to share with. But when we're talking about friendship, um, whether that friendship includes, you know, other romantic or sexual or or intimate connection or just intimate from the sense of platonic intimacy when we're talking about that multiplicity right away i'm struck by how i can genuinely feel like i am acting in your best interest by sharing something that you've shared with sure, me sure yeah right but am i building trust or breaching trust then and that's there, there's no set rule about that, right? It's about our relationship and what right. what you understand about what I have, what, what I will feel is okay about my story. Yeah. And so immediately I'm thinking implicit versus explicit agreements. You can get into a lot of trouble thinking, well, I know what they, I know what they want. I don't need to ask them. Right. So With, I can share. So I don't have an explicit mm -hmm. agreement about this, but... I know them well enough. Yeah, and this is right. a this is a, a quality that we often assign to the people who we we love a lot, especially the longer our relationship goes on. Mm -hmm. I know them. I know you I know you so well. I know you I know better than you. Yeah. I won't even ask you. I right, know I know what you would want me to share and not yeah. share. And that presumption can get me in deep trouble mm -hmm. really quick. <laughs> um but it but it doesn't come up like deep trouble. It can come up with a simple thing like um, sharing how <laughs> a, a story that's coming up for me right now is thinking back to when we were planning we, we went to a wedding together and um, I didn't have a great time at this wedding and you shared with oh my God. <laughs> you shared with someone from that wedding that yep. I didn't have a good time at yep. the wedding and I think it just felt very casual to you, like no big deal. You weren't trying to hurt anyone's feelings, but now the bride's feelings were hurt. Because, because obviously, ouch. I mean, I don't know what I was thinking. <laughs> I my feelings were hurt because I felt like you had. I had just, I just been bitching. I was just complaining, yeah, and I, um, had... and then I blew it off, and it was no big deal. I just didn't yep. have a good time, and it was because I was feeling torn in two. I had two places I needed yeah. to be that day, right. and they were both about weddings. And it was really complicated to decide what to do. And that left me just not having a good time. And then resulting in me isolating myself a little bit from both yep. environments. And and at the, the wash of it was I had complained to you that I was miserable. And you just casually mentioned this a few weeks later to the bride. And yeah, that now I had something that I needed to redress with yep. her because... and. So simple little thing. This yeah. was not actually a big deal. This wasn't a huge violation. I didn't feel like you had harmed me, but you did make work for but me. But I did make trouble. Yeah, I made, you made a... work for me. Made gave me a homework, an emotional homework emotional assignment, homework. Um, by accident, by being a little, a little careless, thoughtless, thoughtless careless, yeah. in in the moment. Just you didn't play out the story. What will mm -hmm. happen if I share this? So, 
I wanted to go to the vault because I think that it's actually a really complicated thing to sort out on a on a day to day basis. And this is why some people um, don't want to have intimacy, don't want to have closeness, because it's just it's too pretty, damn complicated. Yep. And I've seen some of our kids pull away from that and want to sort of wall them off and just wall themselves off and just not share details. Um, out of what looks like fear of how complicated it can all get. Um, you know, who should I share this detail or that detail with this parent or that parent and who'll feel left out? And then there's my friends. Yeah. And should I share all the details of my friends? And if I share a detail from my friend with my, yeah, it can get messy really fast. And avoiding complexity is one of the ways that I see people um, protect themselves, not just from the effort but from love. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So let's go back to trust. When I think about trust um, in, in the past, in, in the old days, I think I placed a really high value on the reliability part. So, you know, mm -hmm. in the boundaries, reliability, accountability, re reliability and accountability were, I, reliability for me was, like if I, if I, if there was a missed um, a time when, you know, something was, yep. was committed to, and then yeah. that was missed. Ooh. And that was a lot. <laughs> that was a way to breach, you know, now a, a, a void would open up between you and I. And that was a lot early on because my reliability and accountability were low. Yeah, in, in they were low. The, what I had practiced in previous relationships and everything, I just it wasn't and all you were that very necessary. Entitled. And oh yeah, right, right. Like, yeah, I just I came mean, with it. You were a mm -hmm. youngest son. You were also a favored son. Um, you, there, there was a sort of golden aura around for you for some reason. For whatever that reason, absolutely was. You were that cute. I no, was you were adorable. not. No, <laughs> but seriously, Did there you see was that crew cut and that big old head. It was really, it's the plaid flag collar that did it for me. Yikes. The 70s. The 70s were rough. So, yeah, I came I, into it with the, with that entitlement and with that, I didn't feel Not to mention all the privilege you have. And the privilege. You yeah. have immense amounts of privilege. So I could get away with stuff. And, so you could get away with stuff. And you never had to really, I mean, you went to college in the 80s. Nobody asked you to account for the fact that you got there largely on your white middle class entitlement no, the so topic, there was just so much yeah, the topic never even came up right of course i was here because of my white entitlement nobody mentioned but, it so right yeah. but that's so, not nobody mentioned it because nobody was having that conversation that yeah. we would have been privy to yep because those conversations were only happening in circles where we already did not deign to go like yep. this is where yeah. it, it's challenging sometimes to to uh remember how deep the entitlement has yeah. gone and so that's how so i bring I, it up because yeah you believed in many ways that you were being reliable and accountable <laughs> i did but it was <laughs> because you believed you were on. entitled to believe you were reliable and accountable yes yeah and me too i don't want to separate myself said. out yeah. but the examples that you come with yeah. are so profound or i believed that i should be treated like i was reliable and accountable Yes. Independent of whether I acted that way. And if yeah. something happened, so accountability became actually a great tool for us mm -hmm. in building trust in our early days of our relationship yeah. because I realized that you were not reliable the way I had imagined you would be. So in all those early days of love, love project, projection, like just, just imagining you to be a person who I had no evidence about whether you were or not. Yeah. Um, I imagined you to be incredibly forthright and reliable. I have no idea why, other why. than I was projecting my own yeah. stuff mm -hmm. onto you. Um, because there wasn't a lot of evidence. those things, but here I am. Well, reliability is one of my stronger yeah. features. Mm -hmm. um, For sure. But, but I, I just wanted that to be true about you. Also, yep. I needed it to be. You needed in reliability. In our early days and, of yeah, relating. You stability in I, that way. I trusted that you were going to catch me because, well, everybody else bailed. Yeah. Um, I was down to just you and your wife. Yep. And my mom. Yep. And my brother. But my brother was not in a place to help me at all, really. And, you know, like just he could only help a little bit because he was caught up with his own family. He was having another baby. It was that was he was not in a place. And my mom was incredibly ill and on dialysis three times a week and waiting for a kidney transplant like so it was you and 
the reliability I was hoping to find, it just didn't, it just wasn't what you were acting on. Yep. It was not. That's, and accountability became the way that we learned to talk about trust. Um, because you introduced a question to me very early on. Because mm-hmm. um, I said, I just can't trust you. And one day you said, well, you can't trust me to do what? I think this is about trusting me to do something specific. That was very helpful. It broke something open because it stopped being vague about, can I trust you? Because you felt like the answer was obvious. I'm trustworthy. Yeah. You can trust me. I am literally trustworthy. Like, I will... Here, see? But the here, see was backed up by nothing other than you telling it. It was just a tautology of you saying, I'm trustworthy, therefore trust me. And then... And you should trust me because I'm trustworthy. (laughs) Exactly. But the evidence of your reliability was just not there. You were sometimes incredibly present for me and other times incredibly absent or even... Um, would close me out of things or would ignore like in- Your, significant problems yeah. that we're going to c- call survival level level issues like right. um, a lack of, of money to put gas in my car to go and get my children from the next thing and yeah. no way to earn that money because of a bunch of situations that you were involved in. Yep. Things like that. Yeah, like things really like that. Core issues. And that's which is why I think I started to ask that question. Because I read, I've been reading about the trust a little bit too, Brene Brown, and and one of the things that catches me about it is the monolithic nature of the way it's talked about trust as its own thing. But, but there are so many elements. There's so many elements, and it. when I started asking you trust to do what, that let me actually take some practical action, I, something to focus on, because I couldn't focus on trust. Right. It was too abstract. It was too abstract. And this is why it was actually helpful. At the time that we were really working through this in a big way, we owned and were running a CrossFit gym. And so we talked to people about accountability all the time. Uh Now, we were generally talking about their accountability to themselves. So they showed up. They had a goal. They had a reason why they were walking through that door, some sort of fitness goal or some health goal that they had or even just a goal of being a crossfitter there were people who came just because yep. they wanted the the, the bragging rights they wanted they the came badge. with owning the, yeah. they wanted the shirt they wanted the t-shirt um it didn't didn't matter but they had this reason and my job my primary job was as i mean i was a lead trainer and my primary job was helping people learn how to be accountable to themselves mm-hmm. oftentimes people will and they still ask me this they ask me to help them be accountable, but I interpret that as my my role is to help you learn how to be accountable to yourself, how mm. to be in alignment with your own values, your own stated values, goals, desires. Because if you're out of alignment, your relationships aren't going to work, including your relationship to yourself, and you're not going to have the life you want. And accountability came fairly easy to me i like that was my um so reliability and accountability like well they were how i survived my childhood yeah. nobody was nobody held me accountable and it wasn't a reliable place so i i made a lot of systems for myself internal systems to try to hold myself accountable so you'd been practicing I mean, those things your whole life otherwise i would have for i would have not made it through high school yeah. let alone i mean i i just wouldn't so i've been practicing and When we started applying that to our relationship, it actually started through the exercise realm. Right. It started through you, you wouldn't show up to class on time. Yeah. So we would trade off teaching classes. Now, so here we are, we're lovers, we're partners, though it was very murky and confusing because we were in very early days when we were married to somebody else and there was a lot of hiding, but we were lovers and partners and we were raising our children together and I worked out with the 6 a.m. class. And you trained that class. And that was pretty straightforward and simple. You worked out with the 4 p.m. class. And yeah. I trained that class. And I have a rule. Same rule that the 6 a.m. class is. But you don't have to beat the 6, 6 a.m. people up about this. They do it themselves. They show up on time. And they do their warm-up. The 4 p.m. class is often coming in already just decision fatigued. And right. just already worn down. And really needs to kind of be coaxed into it. Not all of them. But a lot of them mm-hmm. needed to be coaxed into it. You included. I mean, you totally had included. I had a day of... So, yeah. so frequently you would come in 10 minutes late and have missed the warm-up and want to jump into the workout. So what did I make you do instead? Burpees. 
Right. Why? Because I was the trainer. <laughs> yep. And and that that's, was the rule. The rule was the rule. You here's what you agreed it's to. What I agreed to. What you agreed to is either show up on time for the warm up. Yep. Or do the do your burpees. And what I love about this is you couldn't deny the rule. We're standing in this room full of other people who you know are also asking to be held accountable right. and asking Could to be not so you had to do it. Push back on that. Yeah. So that was... And that translated. Some practice. It did. In... It, it was practice and it was practice for years. I mean, you must have done thousands of makeup burpees. <laughs> yes, it's true. <laughs> um, no wonder your shoulders look like that. Right. But, but then later, when we were really digging in on how are we going to make this relationship not just okay, not just average, but how are we going to level up? I mm -hmm. want... I want elite level relating. I, I yes. want, you know, if I wanted elite level fitness back then, I want elite level relating now. Yeah. Um, and so transfer of skills, yep. holding yourself accountable became the key there though, because yeah. we had to transfer your being held accountable by an external system that was, Hey, you have to do burpees. Yeah. Or me as the trainer to yeah. how are you going to hold yourself accountable for what you say you're going to do? And our dog is snoring in the background. Yeah, right I now. don't know if that's getting and picked <laughs> up, but he's he's snoring. <laughs> oh my! So, what did it feel like for you when you when we were in the early days um, of the of up leveling yep. this relationship yep. and 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 building the foundation of trust that we have today, while also practicing non monogamy? What was it like for you? to wrestle with that accountability well, issue. Well, um, right away, I remember the feeling of, I did not want you, my partner, to be holding that for me. Mm -hmm. I felt like that was not, it wasn't the elite level relating that I wanted. I didn't want to show up as somebody that you had to tell what to do all the time. Yeah. Not because I don't want to be told what to do, because honestly, I do. It's much simpler than coming it up with myself, yeah. but because I didn't want you to have to do that work. You had enough stuff to do. You were you were taking care of so much already. I didn't want me to be one of those things in that area. And from my perspective, I I wanted one to see you as as really capable. And that I way. wanted to be, and I still do want to be capable. That and I way. wanted a I wanted a peer, a partner. Yes, a peer, I didn't a partner. want to be in charge of you. Now we have gone through periods of time where we've been involved in power exchange dynamics. We can do another episode on on kink dynamics and power exchange that i'm going to hold that separate yeah, for this time that, okay yeah that um, makes sense because that is that that's an has agreement also about been interesting work though oh, about trust sure. and about yeah. actually exchanging power explicitly yep but this the first thing i remember you doing was telling me that you were going to hold yourself accountable for <laughs> oh goodness any it, number um, of things so it didn't many really things. happen my my word for 2020 was accountable I didn't do a great job with it. I'm still Wait. struggling with. It's one of the harder things. Accountability for you. Yep. So. It's embarrassing, but there it is. But here's the thing that you do. You do a great job. You, I think you actually you do better with accountability. Well, I hope I do better. <laughs> you do no so much better because you do take ownership of your mistakes and mm. you apologize and you make amends and you fix things. So that's the accountability. My reliability is still reliability not where I want it to be, but at least I'll take accountability for and it. And I don't think it's as problematic as, as you think it is, or you'd be hearing about me. You'd, you'd be <laughs> hearing it from me <laughs> more true. often. Well, now I'm, ho now I'm holding myself to it. Right. So, so I look at it. not just holding yourself accountable, you're holding I'm yourself looking reliable. Yes. I'm holding myself reliable and uh, I'm do I don't do as well as I want to. So, Good. That means that's my problem and nobody else's. That's so was something my goal. that has been helpful for me around this. When I think about, do I if I want other people to trust me, okay, then I want to be reliable. So I need to make clear to myself and to them what I'm actually agreeing to. Yes. Because yep. a lot of times when I have found myself accused of being unreliable, when I actually sit with it, I realize, wait, did we ever actually agree to that, or are they holding me to an implicit standard because this has come up with co-parenting disagreements where yeah. i'm like wait actually i'm being reliable to what i agreed to and you're being reliable to what you agreed to but we don't agree on what that is yeah right <laughs> and so and we needed to agree we needed to agree to disagree in that case and it's also sometimes a sneaky kind of boundary violation to hold somebody accountable 
for something they didn't agree to. Yeah, or you did, you never even asked, you never had a conversation. You never had a conversation. And here's what shows up a lot in my work with couples is they'll they'll look back. If you go if you have a long relationship, if you look back through the relationship long enough, usually you can find an example of an agreement that you made, a subtle agreement somewhere or something that got said during some argument that backs up any position. Like right. you've, yeah. you've talked That's... about so many things yep. over the course of your relating that everybody can find their defense, their reason yep. for acting. So um, if I am going back a long ways to look for a reason why I'm mad at you, why I don't trust you now, oh. that's a cue for me oh, yeah, okay. to check in like, wait, wait. So this is probably a conversation we need to have to update what it means for us to have an agreement and to be able to trust each other. Yeah, I've totally Because if I'm going that. back, yep. like five, yeah, I mean. I felt that. Like, so, but you, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Is that still relevant? You so know, th I'm thinking of an example. Good. I know examples can be tougher for you to pull up. Um, recently, um, you bought me a gift. Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> you bought me a gift and, and I needed to tell you, um, the gift itself, I'm going to set, I'm going to set aside the, the gift and this isn't a comment on this particular gift, but what did we agree to about gifts? That I wouldn't get you one. Right. And that we agreed to that because... I have a, a, a whole bunch of feelings about getting gifts, but also um, you often get me things that don't fit yep. or they like, it's just been challenging for you to figure out what I actually want or yeah, like buy me chocolate when I'm not eating chocolate or buy, yeah, just yeah. off. Yeah. And so we had agreed from a, in a good place, we had agreed on, please don't buy me gifts. Instead, what I would love is acts of service. Yep. That works great for me. Like offer to take my car out and fill it with gas or um, clean up the porch or whatever. That fills me up. And we'd agreed to it. Yep. And you got a gift anyways. My problem wasn't the gift. You'd actually done a really good job this time and gotten a really nice gift and it was lovely. But my concern was that you hadn't, like, we had an agreement. Yeah. But you looked back. You looked back. You looked back yep. many years and you were like, yep. but... But remember when, and you told a story <laughs> about when I had been disappointed that there wasn't a gift. That story you were telling was like 10 years old, yeah. <laughs> way outdated to the yeah, agreement so, so, uh, that we had made mm -hmm. recently, like as recent as a couple months before we had updated our agreement about what we yeah. do um, and and what, what gifting looks like for us. Because it's not that you don't buy me gifts, it's just that we handle it differently. We choose yeah. them together, things like that. Yeah. Um, when I heard you going way back into your memory... It's like, oh, oh, there we go. That's, yeah. So what are you doing then? Defending. Oh, like looking, yeah, yeah, like right. Just, just defending. Just looking because for an excuse. Actually, excuse, an excuse. Yeah. Looking for an excuse. And looking to avoid responsibility for having violated the agreement we made. And because you're hurting in that moment. Like, there's real hurt. Here's the thing. I could see it. There was hurt because first off, you thought you'd done a good job on the gift and you did. And I tried to set it aside, but it's hard to separate. It's hard things. to separate, but we've gotten, gotten more complicated over the years. And But then you were hurting because you'd let yourself down. Yep. And I think that that's a good sign. The fact mm. that you didn't yeah. ask me to take care of that hurting feeling and you were like, I could see that you were, you had watery eyes and, and I could see that you were, your, your heart was soft, but you were like, right, right. I'm, I'm I'm telling myself a story from the old days to justify how I feel now. Yeah. But our trust is built on current agreements. Yep. Not right. on the fact that six years ago we we said this or that. And it, and that's where I find explicit, flexible, and resilient agreements. I mean, they have to be revisited with frequency, um, because. Because that's the only way you're going to know that you're both up to date. Well, right. And because that's where we can build trust. Yeah. Continually. It's not simple because that part of you that wanted to defend, I, like, I totally get why. Right. But, um, but the accountability in there, I feel like that's one of the keys to resilience. So when something like that happens, and in this case, me, and I say, yes, you're right. We agreed to something else and I did this. 
So I'm sorry that, but, but it was me. And so we'll go from here without that. I would say, well, from ex personal experience, take that piece out. It we've, we've just hit a wall and there's yeah. nowhere to go. And, and I think there is a place to go. And for us, it has been a little external help. <laughs> okay. Yes. A little no, external help yep. getting, getting a, a boost over the, um, there's now a breach that's opened up. There's a, yeah. there's a, there's a, um, there's, we have to rebuild. Rebuilding trust is part of relating. It's normal. I, I think it that we actually f find ourselves in a lot more pain when we expect that we'll never have to be rebuild trust because, in fact, yeah. we're always building and rebuilding. Yeah. Um, and they don't have to be huge breaches, but we're living beings. This is just how it is. And when what you were just talking about makes me think about how how much more calm you are describing this tells me that you're in integrity with yourself these days that's a good point so when, you, when i'm not oh I, i'm all panicky i'm all over the place right yeah. and and acknowledging your shadow acknowledging that you don't get this right is very helpful for feeling like yep i i can build this trust from a place of integrity because I know I'm not all good, all bad. I'm not going to get things right all right. the time. And the more I know about myself, so I know what to what to promise and how to account for stuff I'm probably going to do wrong, you know, prepare for it and set up for success. The better I know myself, the better you can trust me. Yeah. Yeah. So the last um, letter of the framework, the braving mm. framework, is generosity. I love this one, and I find it to be probably the biggest challenge when I'm when I'm coaching someone in a, a non-monogamy agreement. We're we're talking through that um, the agreement now. In the early days of the agreement setting, often everything's going okay, but generosity asks you to assume goodwill, mm -hmm. to assume a generous imagination of of the intent. Um, I think people find this easier to do in some areas than in others. But often when we're making a shift into consensual non-monogamy or we're stretching into new areas where we're not sure about trust or we're up against our own demons, our own like yeah. the things we, we can't even trust ourselves about, it becomes really yeah. hard yep. to extend that generosity of spirit. Um, we're all interpreting each other's actions and words all the time yes. and assigning meaning to it. And something I see come up all the time is she did this because that. He did this this because that. They did this because that. So one this, person assigning very clear uh, meaning motivation, and motivation meaning to another person's actions. And if the outcome was hurt or or distrust the assignment of ill intent, it really it opens up the rift even further. It, yeah. it stretches that gap. There's further to to span. There's much. There's more work to do to rebuild. And something I've noticed recently is how that appears to actually be many people's defense. That's the assignment of the ill will. The assignment of ill will, um, because often they've already struck back. They've already oh. started taking actions so, to get even. So they justify. And so now we're caught in a yeah. like mutual dance of, I think you did something wrong, so I'm going to stretch our agreement this way. So you, if you're going to put boundary violate, then I'm going to boundary violate. Mm -hmm. But nobody's really talking about that except to place blame. So yep. it's really just the hot potato of blame now. Oh, yeah. Right. Tossed back and forth across the chasm. Oof. <sighs> yeah. So I want to I want to say that the generosity piece is important and yet on the other side people who assume who always assume goodwill can place themselves in a in a situation where they wind up actually being coerced. Yep. And coercion is a very real um not a threat. It's a it's a it's a real thing that happens in our relationships where we agree to things we don't mean to because we're we're, we're manipulated or because we're, we don't want to hold our boundary. So how does that come out of um, 
Say more about how that comes out of the generosity. There. Yeah, so assuming assuming goodwill at all times, like assuming that at all times, even when you're in brand new territory, mm -hmm. I, what I notice is that it can lead people to, to set themselves up to be repeatedly taken advantage of the same way over and over again. So okay. here's an example. Um, the first time you're having a safer sex agreement conversation with your partner you're gonna you're gonna start engaging in intimate activities sexual activities with other people the first time you have the conversation you want to start it from a place of generosity and and goodwill and the first time there's a violation of that and someone comes back and says actually i didn't use a condom for this activity or that you know like freaking out and and you know leaping to massive blame isn't super helpful but neither is saying well i know you mean well and not doing anything about it mm -hmm. and not and not even having okay. a conversation about how that makes you feel and just circling right back to okay so you won't do it again um over and over again mm -hmm. so the first time okay so what are the consequences of that you know we need to get tested now um we need to wait a period of time before we have unprotected sexual activity between us there's like reasonable the, the consequences, practical consequences yeah. of the actions but uh, but then and then there's the next step so the consequences happen and the next step is okay so so now what's the agreement again okay now we go out we explore and if you keep your agreements now my my job then is to move on and and to go back to assuming generosity. But if you continually violate that, if you if you just continually oh, yeah. like ask forgiveness rather than hold to your agreement. So if there's a pattern of behavior, the assuming good intent for a pattern of behavior that violates the agreement you got. It doesn't it, really make sense. It means the agreement sense. isn't it's, really it's, holding, yeah. right? So now we have a question about the agreement. And we have a question to, to really, this is where I think it is really helpful to revisit the agreement because the agreement isn't working. It's, it's, not, yeah. it's clearly not working for somebody either. Or your partner doesn't want this agreement yep. and that's why it's not working. Right. Either the agreement isn't well communicated or the boundaries aren't or your partner is not able to hold so their the agreement they're not able to be re the two reliable of you, or the, you know the yeah one thing that i think comes up frequently though around trust is um you know do what do i trust my partner to do mm -hmm. and i do think that a generous interpretation of you know my my partner's intent goes a long way to accepting their bids for reconnection. Yes. So yeah. even though there are consequences for these breaches, even though there are consequences for taking action, like the life has con life will deliver you consequences too. These don't have to right. be manufactured consequences. Um, reminding myself that you are a person who I have chosen to have a close relationship to and that I want to be in that relationship lets me turn back toward you and open again so that your bid for reconnection can be accepted. Yes. And I, I and that can see be challenging because I, I can want to turn that. away, yep. run in the other direction right. or pull away or make yourself. you prove mm -hmm. or make you so for every time you make a mistake or intentionally violate a trust, if I close up harder and climb higher in my tower of, of aloofness or grandiosity, and you have to climb higher and higher to get to me. Um, yeah, there, there is a way that that can play out that is really, really challenging for your partner to to find ways back in. Yes, it, it makes it harder and harder. But, but you've shown a lot of patience around this. At times I have walled off, closed up, and you've shown patience with your rebids, um, especially lately. I've seen you sh show more patience. If I'm still walled off and closed up, um, I've seen you just slow down. And and something that works well for us is to slow down and try to synchronize our breathing, mm -hmm. even if we can yep. barely tolerate each other's eye contact yep. yet, and just breathe together for a while. 
until I can tolerate the idea that, in fact, you aren't evil, but you have either made a mistake or you have intentionally violated my trust, in which case I still I still want to get to the bottom of it yeah. in a way that lets me figure out what our next step is. And so that's something that over the years I've, I've developed a trust in you that right now it looks like you're like you don't want to sorry, let me say this more clearly, in a situation like that, it looks to me like, okay, you need you need to like get away from me. But I have learned to trust that that's temporary and yeah. that the relationship that we have is is still at the foundation of of us and that there is a way back. Right. And, this and I is, didn't used to think that. I used to think no, there was not yeah, a way and back and that it was the end of everything. The end, right? There, there so, could be an end point all the time. And so the constant... Um, uh, disruption and rebuilding of trust over the years and the de- how, as we both develop skills there that's what lets me um, believe in it yeah and something I've been struggling with around trust has to do with dating and trust um, hmm. there's a there's just a, a there's a path you're walking as you start to date someone and how fast you develop trust with them it can be oh, really yeah. complicated mm-hmm. to figure out um, I can be quite quick to trust certain people and, and then they just ghost, they just disappear. Yeah. Um, or I can trust their words, but then I'm watching closely and looking at their actions and saying, I don't know this person very well and their actions don't align. That's a clue. You know, I have to look at that. Um, so I, I want to just mention that I think the conversation around trust and how we build trust right from the beginning, especially in dating, especially with, you know, dating multiple people and trying to figure out what it feel, what feels like trust to us and how we want to build our new agreements. That deserves its own whole episode. Uh-huh. That is, yeah. um, I got the crap kicked out of me over this past year with people you violating did. my trust, ditching me out of nowhere or ghosting me or um, just... Um, changing their minds with no explanation. And those are all things they get to do. But it has made it very hard for me to trust that um, that that there is a line after which, yeah, like, I trust right. you to do a certain set of things. Oh, dating can really kick you around because we're, we don't necessarily get to a spot where we have these clear agreements yeah. early on. Or even if we do have the clear agreements, you know, everybody gets to change their mind. And changing their mind doesn't necessarily mean I'll ever get to know what right. the heck happened or why. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a bunch there's a bunch of stuff to there's unpack in shorter term yeah. relationships. And, you know, I was recently I'm doing a new study on jealousy. So I'm doing a lit review and I was looking for real hard data on what def- term what defines a long term relationship. And I was shocked oh. to find out that yeah. Yeah, the literature mostly just says, like, you know, long-term relationships because they're long-term relationships. The, the literature points in the direction of, well, short and long-term relationships look the same pretty much at the outset. And we only know that they become long-term when they become long-term. So we arbitrarily <laughs> pick a, a time. And a lot of researchers choose the, the onset of sexual activity, which does not work for me, because I do not require a long ramp up for that. Well, that personally. could be an hour and a half. Is that how long is that? Who knows? I... And so it doesn't make any sense. But um, short term relationships, by design or by that's the course of it, trust is going to look and feel different. Right. Yeah. Um, just like it looks and feels different in the workplace versus at home. Okay. I'm not surprised that this episode no, went longer. No, it could longer. go on. There's a lot more we could unpack. I definitely want to come back to this, and I want to go sure. dig into the research more mm-hmm. because um, there's a lot that I think all of us could learn about how to grow every relationship in our life and to do some of the work that our communities need Yes. to stop yeah. the constant massive polarization, mm-hmm. um, and it's around trust. So, to be continued. So keep talking to each other. Thanks so much for tuning in to this episode. I've got one more thing I'd like to share with you, and that you're just going to need to hop over to the website listentojolie.com. 
There you can grab my top five relationship guides for free right now. Go get those guides. They're great. They're easy to implement conversations that will help you take action in creating the love you really want. It's my mission to make absolutely everything talk aboutable. She managed to help me be able to talk about stuff that I once couldn't even imagine saying out loud. Now I speak openly with my, my lovers, my friends, my family, and you um, on a podcast. Out loud relationship work really can change everything. That really is a wonder. One of my favorite things in the whole world. So when you're feeling the rough edges, when things aren't going the way that you'd hoped in your relationships, I want you to remember that relationships can be messy and that's good news.